this video demonstrates production methods for embedding and sectioning 50 to 100 otoliths at once. The entire process requires three days and will produce one millimeter sections of otoliths that can be used for age determination. The first step is to make sure the molds are clean and free of any old resin from previous pours. We do this by scraping the mold with a chisel. You want to clean out the grooves of the tray using the edge of the chisel as well. Next we grease the molds with a paste finishing wax. We use Johnson paste wax. This acts as a releasing agent. Apply a thin layer of the wax all over the mold, on the walls, in the corners, and in the ridges. Avoid any buildup of wax though. You just want a thin layer to coat it. The next step is to place two pieces of spaghetti in the embedding tray. One piece diagonally, from corner to corner, and the other vertically on the left-hand side. These will be used as references later once the sample is cut multiple times. Next, we measure out the epoxy and hardener. All pouring of epoxy resin is done under the fume hood. A solution of clear casting epoxy pigmented black with 100 milliliters of pigment has been pre-mixed. Be sure to shake the epoxy to make sure the dye is distributed evenly. Place a plastic cup on the scale and tar the scale. In this exercise, we are making one tray, so we use 75 grams of epoxy. The epoxy to hardener ratio is roughly 125 to 1. After pouring the resin, make sure you wipe the mouth of the jar after each use. If resin is left on the mouth of the jar, the lids will eventually get glued on and the caps will have to be broken free. In this lab, we keep lists of resin to hardener concentrations on the side of the fume hood. Next, we add hardener. So we tear the scale again, and based on our chart, we add 0.6 grams of hardener. This measurement has to be fairly exact because the epoxy and hardener together have an exothermic reaction and if mixed incorrectly could cause a fire. Use a spoon to mix the epoxy and hardener and then gently pour enough of the mixture into the tray to cover the spaghetti strand and fill the corners. Be sure to put all resin coated garbage in the garbage bin in the fume hood as well. The resin is then left to set for one day when it, and when ready it should feel tacky. Once the epoxy is set after one day, it is ready for the otoliths. Remove the tray from the fume hood and place it under a desktop vent. In this lab, we are equipped with portable vents, which are also appropriate to use when working with the trays outside of the fume hood. We need to mark the embedding medium so as to create a reference line. Use a straight edge and line it up at the distal ends of the tray using the existing grooves as a guide. Score the medium with a knife or a sharp point. Create five lines in total. The otoliths will later be placed on, on, with their cores precisely aligned on these marks. Remove the otoliths from their envelopes and mark the cores. In this example, we're embedding cod. So we look for a small bump on the sulcus side near the center of the otolith. The sulcus side is the, on the convex side of the otolith with the groove. Use a pencil, not a pen, to mark the core. Once the cores are marked, the otoliths are then placed sulcus side or convex side up so the marked cores lie aligned on the etched lines. Place the pairs of otoliths on the embedding medium with the anterior or thicker end up and the posterior or pointy end down away from the screws on the tray.
It's a good practice to keep a log detailing the position of each otolith in each row on the tray. If your otolith samples are consecutive numbers, simply note the, s the series in each row and make note of any missing or broken otoliths. You can still use broken otoliths. Typically a break will happen right around the middle, but as long as you can still mark the core, the otolith can be embedded as would other otoliths by aligning the core with the etched line on the plate. If you are working with numerous otoliths, you can certainly um, embed them closer together than what we have shown here. To embed the otoliths, mix a second batch of the epoxy resin as before. For this one, we're going to be starting at 175 grams of resin mixed with 1.4 grams of hardener. That's for one plate. Again, these uh, ratios will be, or these concentrations will be posted on the side of the fume hood. Tire the scale again, <clears throat> and then apply 1.4 grams of hardener with a disposable pipette. Stir the epoxy again with a spoon to make sure it is evenly distributed. And then we're going to pour the top coat over the otoliths that we placed on the lines in our tray. Pouring the epoxy on top of the otoliths has to be done cautiously. Take care not to knock the core off alignment while ensuring that no air bubbles get trapped under the otoliths. To do this, drizzle the epoxy resin gently over each otolith using a spoon. Allow the resin to seep under each sample. Continue spooning the mixture over the otoliths until they are completely submerged. Once the otoliths have a good cover on them, you can continue spooning or pour out the rest of the resin so that it fills up the corners and brings the level of the resin up to the edge of the tray. If you happen to drop any epoxy on the bench, you can clean it up using acetone. It's a good practice if embedding multiple trays to be sure to give tr each tray an ID and label. Masking tape can be easily transferred from the tray to the hardened plate once the epoxy has set and the plate removed. Now you can leave the plate in the fume hood for another 24 hours to harden. Once the plates have hardened for 24 hours in a fume hood, they can be removed from the trays. You can start by undoing the bolts at the top of the trays. And you'll probably have to remove one of the sides of the trays as well. And this is done by removing the screws on the bottom of the plate. To remove the plate, you might have to use a chisel and a mallet just to pop it free. Just a few taps and it should release. If necessary, you might have to use a drill to widen the holes created by the screws in the tray. This ins ensures that the plate will fit on the pegs of the saw. We use a modified surface grinder, which was modified to include a diamond edge cutting wheel with a mounting bracket, the cutting base, a water outlet, and a splash tray with drainage. To actually cut your plate, set the plate on the pegs of, of the saw using a ratchet to tighten the screws until the plate is secure. 
you want to put the plate in upside down to what you poured it in the tray. The process of cutting involves removing a one millimeter strip through the middle of each ridge on the plate and discarding the material in between. Because the core of each otolith lies beneath the ridges, adjust the bed of the saw so that the distal edge, or the furthest edge, of the first ridge is aligned with the blade. This is done by eye by adjusting the vertical and lateral control wheels. You'll also want to check the blade so that it is just below the surface of the plate. You don't want to cut too deep when you're making your cuts. Next, turn on the main water supply and adjust the flow. Ideally, you want just enough water to wash away the dust. <clears throat> then turn on the power. You're ready to make your first cut. Turn the horizontal control wheel slowly and steadily until the entire length of the plate is cut. Remove and discard the first piece that falls off. This contains the outer regions or anterior halves of the otoliths and these are not used for aging. <clears throat> Once you make your first cut, move the blade back to the starting position. We are now ready to remove the cores of the otoliths. Move the bed of the saw so that the blade is aligned with the center of the ridge. This is done by turning the small wheel 70 increments. The result is a one millimeter section. This section will then be rinsed and dried. Repeat this procedure until you have cut along all five grooves of the plate. And remember to keep, keep each strip in order so as not to lose track of the samples. If this happens, use the spaghetti markers to reconstruct the mold. After your last cut, remove the final section, rinse the sections off in water, and then put them on a piece of paper towel just to air dry. When finished cutting, remove the remainder of your, your plate, and let the water drain out. And just be sure to clean the saw up when you're finished. If you notice any debris, use the probe to poke through the little drain holes in the uh, bottom of the tray, just to clear any debris that might have built up. To mount your sections so they are easier to read under the image analysis system, lay a piece of paper down and then take a piece of pre-cut plexiglass, remove one side of the protective film, then coat liberally with Krylon. The Krylon is an acrylic clear spray. Lay your strips down on the plexiglass and then give them another coat of Krylon. Some tips when doing this procedure. Um, if you number your odalis on the strip, you will want to use pencil or a diamond pen. Otherwise, the Krylon will cause the pen or marker to smudge. You can put your label on before or after spraying. And again, this should be pre-printed or done in pencil so that it will avoid smudging. The Krylon will take about two days to fully dry, after which the sections are ready for viewing and aging under an image analysis system or a microscope. The Krylon coating has the same effect as immersing the sections in liquid, 
which is to smooth out any surface roughness and to greatly improve the visibility of the growth increments.